dear students in this video we are going to discuss certain features and certain clinical characteristics which are important to assess in patients with spontaneous bacterial peritonitis so let's flow along this case where a 50 year old male with ascites with chronic liver disease and portal hypertension is admitted in the ic with increasing respiratory distress and altered mental status for past one day. There is history of fever, yellowish discoloration of skin and swelling of the legs since past one week. Patient is febrile with a temperature of 102. Blood pressure is 110 by 60. Heart rate is 120. Respiratory rate is 36. Saturation is 80 to 85 percent on room air. The abdomen is diffusely tender but bowel sounds are present. The patient has put on HFNO for half an hour, but with no subsequent improvement. And therefore, the patient was transferred onto invasive mechanical ventilation. A bedside ultrasound shows all the findings which are consistent with CLD, sclerosis, and ascites, but there are no distinguishable focal lesions which can be accounted for the sudden complications which have happened. So what should be our differential diagnosis? So of course, other than SBP, there can be perforated hollow viscous or perinephric abscess, pyelonephritis or mesenteric ischemia or what we call as NOMI in critical care that is non-occlusive mesenteric ischemia. So with all of these possibilities in a patient who is elderly and who is having comorbidities as well, how to evaluate further? So in the diagnostic workup, we have to, it is critical because this patient can progress rapidly to shock and multi-organ failure. So what we can do initially, we can do a peritoneal fluid analysis and see the cell count differentials, send the culture, or we'll look at the lactate level and the pH. And therefore, it is it can rule out all possible sources of sepsis. Additionally, blood and urine cultures should be obtained before initiation of antibiotic therapy. But it is important to realize that the most Accurate predictor of SBP is a polymorphonuclear count or granulocytes such as neutrophils and basophils and a count of more than 500 per microliter in a sample of ascitic fluid. In case it is suspected that there is a perforation, then a CT should be considered. Of course, by CT we mean a CECT that is contrast enhanced. And the important fact feature is that the presence of leukocyte esterase in the ascitic fluid is shown to have a sensitivity of 100% in the diagnosis of SBP when it is compared with the EMN count, polymorphonuclear leukocytes. So if there is available of the facility in the, in, the, in the biochemistry lab or in the clinical laboratory, then it needs to be seen whether leuc leukocyte esterase is present in the sample of peritoneal fluid that has been sent for the investigations. So... If within the okay, within that there are certain subsets of ascitic fluid collections if you see and how we how we pick up the diagnosis of spontaneous bacterial peritonitis is important because in spontaneous bacterial peritonitis the pmn count is more than 250 cells and as well as the culture is positive in culture negative neurocytic ascites which is again one differential diagnosis and a mimic of spontaneous bacterial peritonitis it is the polymorphs would be high would be more than 500 but the cultures are negative and in monomicrobial non-neutrocytic bacterial uh, ascites the counts would be less than 250 and the cultures would be positive so this is one way of trying to find out the mimics and, and separating the mimics or filtering out the mimics from spontaneous bacterial peritonitis and the one important investigation that is very important and useful to determine the etiology of ascites is the serum ascites albumin gradient or which what we call a SAG 
that is the difference between the serum albumin to the ascites albumin. The critical concept is that the ascites is either made in the liver sinusoid or not by the liver. So hepatic sinusoid is designed to keep the albumin in the blood. So the diseased hepatic sinusoid becomes even less likely to allow albumin to escape this uh, escape this to the blood into the hepatic limb because there is already capillarization and fibrosis because the disease process is ongoing and it is in a chronic stage. So if the, there is a high sag, which is more than 1.1, because that is not much albumin in the fluid, the ascites is in the hepatic lymph and it is produced by a sinusoid, which is having a high hydrostatic pressure or a reduced oncotic pressure or a portal hypertension. On the contrary, if it is a low sag that is less than 1.1, then this ascites plasma, albumin is close to the plasma because the ascites is in the plasma, not in the liver. And there are extra hepatic sources like malignancy, infection due to tuberculosis, trauma, pancreatitis, which all may be responsible. So based upon this cutoff value of 1.1, we can distinguish between whether this rise or rising ascites is, 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 a, contribution, is a contribution because of hepatic sinusoids or there is any extra hepatic source. So if we see, if we follow this, that if the SAG is more than 1.1 and the total protein in the ascites is less than 2.5, the causes would be cirrhosis, portal venous thrombosis, and the late Barchieri syndrome. If the SAG is less than 1.1, then it is usually because of nephrotic syndrome because there is non-portal hypertension. So this portal hypertension or is, is, is a very important factor and the SAG can rule that out. Similarly, if the total protein is more than 2.5, it usually means it is post-hepatic and in that presence of a greater than 1.1 SAG value indicating portal hypertension, there is, it can be because of CHF, constrictive pericarditis, etc. Whereas if it is less than 1.1, that indicates certain other conditions like malignancy, peritoneal carcinomatosis, TV, serositis, etc. So we have to remember this, this table can be useful in distinguishing the post-hepatic and the pre- and intrahepatic causes and also from the view of port presence or absence of portal hypertension. So in diagnostic workup, we have a diagnostic para paracentesis reveals in this patient a TLC of 750, greater than 80% neutrophils, protein of 2, albumin of 0.3, and serum albumin of 2.2. So we should remember that patients who are at high risk for SVP, they include patients with GI bleed and cirrhosis, patients who already had SVP of one time or once or be more before in the past, cirrhotic patients with an ascitic fluid protein of less than 1.5 with renal failure, Cirrhotic patients hospitalized for cause other than SVP, SVP and having an ascitic protein concentration of less than one. So these are all at high risk for SVP. So if you look into this, into and the levels which has been found, we can clearly say that with such a count, with 80%, 90% of the neutrophils and serum albumin of 2.2 and the SAG, which we will, we can, we can see that that, if you see the albumin is 0.3 here and the serum albumin is 2.2. So 2.2 minus 0.3 is 1.9. So which is greater than 1.1. So obviously it is a liver cause and there is portal hypertension alongside which has to be treated as per the protocol. So what are the common organisms which are responsible for SBP? Most commonly in 75% of the cases, it is caused by gram-negative organisms, with the predominating bug being the Klebsiella for in over 50% of the cases. Gram-positive aerobic microorganisms are responsible for a vast number of the remainder cases, most common being the Streptococcus pneumoniae or the Viridens group Streptococci. And also it is important to realize that the ascitic fluid typically has a high oxygen tension, therefore anaerobic organisms which depend largely on the availability of oxygen to thrive and grow, they are not commonly seen because of this, which, which cannot thrive, I mean to say, uh, in, in the presence of oxygen, they are not seen. In the majority of the cases, one infective organism is involved, although a small number of cases have been reported as 
polymicrobial. So what are the other risk factors for SVP? Decompensated cirrhotic patients are at the highest risk of developing SVP. Infective organisms typically originate from the intestinal lumen from where they pass via translocation. And finally, they reach the mesenteric lymph nodes from where they spread farther, both ascend below and descend downwards. Additional risk factors for SVP include a previous history of SVP, low complement levels and reduced synthesis of proteins with associated prolonged PT and reduced protein levels in the acytic fluid that is less than one gram per deciliter. And also, if the patient has been on long-term PPI therapy, such as increased gastric pH with PPI use, that promotes also gut bacterial growth and translocation to the other sites. So the management depends with the empiric antibiotic therapy, that is that a Third generation cephalosporins like ceftriaxone and cefixin can be started in patients with suspected SVP and with a PMN count of greater than 250 cells on the acytic fluid analysis. Exceptions patients with recent beta lactam antibiotic exposure or diagnosis of SVP in a nosocomial setting, this may be challenging because this antibiotic may not work and <clears throat> we need to give extra coverage for against pseudomonas too. Follow up analysis of acytic fluid to assess the PMN count should be performed at least over 48 to 72 hours. And if there is lack of improvement for over 48 hours of therapy, that may indicate an underlying perforation or abscess formation which may require surgery. So a CCT would be useful and proper. And patients with SVP and either a serum creatinine of more than one or a bun of more than 30 or total bilirubin of more than four should get IV albumin as adjunct. Now, there is also a growing concern about the increase in the multidrug resistant bugs and their complications in patients with cirrhosis and SBP because this was a, there was an increased incidence of sepsis, which is, which is systemic and quickly at a quick progression to multi organ dysfunction and failure. So, the nosocomial origin correlates with a higher multidrug resistant proportion, organism proportion, more complications and lower antimicrobial susceptibility rates in most of the used antibiotics. So in the in this paper, they have used 12 commonly used antibiotics and they have found that. Yeah. And this MDROs are confirmed as an isolated predictor in inpatient mortality and complications in logistic regression. So this is a, something important one needs to identify. And if one suspects the growth of MDR organisms, one should go for select judiciously the antibiotics which are likely to work in this setting. Now community acquired SBP had more gram negative bacteria like enterobacterialis, the nosocomial SBP which I told had gram positive bacteria such as the enterococci and the staphylococci and so it may be quite meaningful to add at least some additional drugs such as the clindamycin or if one can think of adding vancomycin or, say, or ticoclanin to cover them up. So the concerns and complications, the renal failure is the major cause of death in patients with spontaneous bacterial peritonitis and it occurs in nearly one third, that is 30 to 40 percent of the patients. So this risk can be minimized by giving IV albumin, especially when the creatinine is high of more than one, barney is more than 30 and the total bilirubin is more than four. Treatment with octreotide or midodrine is helpful if renal failure develops. The infection-related mortality in SBP is very low with appropriate treatment. And in hospital settings, the non-infection-related mortality in SBP can also be very high, 20 to 40, 40 percent, which is quite high, and a one to two year mortality of 70 to 80 percent. So this is primarily because of the liver failure or the renal failure secondary to the liver failure. So if you look into the antibiotic prophylaxis to prevent spontaneous bi bacterial peritonitis in people with liver cirrhosis, though this is a network meta-analysis and based on very low uh, certainty evidence, there is considerable uncertainty about whether antibiotic prophylaxis is beneficial and if beneficial, which antibiotic prophylaxis is most beneficial in such patients with cirrhosis and ascites with low protein and history of SB. So it is more left to the rule of the court of the physician to decide what it is but if we follow this algorithm it is probably you we can we it can be helpful that you, in in diagnosis and treatment of svp 
first you do a diagnostic paracentesis and look at the ascitic fluid cell count and differentials and look for the ascitic fluid bacterial culture. If the PMN count is more than 250, then you follow the, the, the pathway to, to your right. That is presumptive SVP. Begin with an empiric antibiotic therapy with the cefotaxime or ceftriaxone, two grams uh, eight hourly and IV albumin on day one and day three if the serum creatinine is more than one, but more than 30 and total bilirubin more than four. Then follow them up if the positive on culture, no, then complete the five-day antibiotic course. And if culture is positive, if it is confirmed as VP, then narrow the antibiotic regime based on the susceptibility results to complete the five-day course. If the PMN is less than 250, then we look for the signs and symptoms of infection. Whether <clears throat> it is yes, if it is yes, then we begin the empiric antibiotic therapy for SVP in the same way that we had done for those patients with counts more than 250. But if the culture is, the if the sign symptoms are absent, we look into the culture. If the culture is also not positive, then there is no indication for antibiotics. If it is yes, then we go for repeat the diagnostic paracentesis and culture growth and look for the culture growth. So this is one of the easiest algorithm which can be followed to treat such patients of spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. So at the end, the take-home message would be that SBP is virtually occurs in patients with cirrhosis and ascites when it is suspected when the patient presents with abdominal pain, fever, and altered mental status. There is a very short window of opportunity for treating SBP because it can produce, it can rapidly progress to multi-organ failure and shock, and that is due to septic shock, and it can also cause renal failure. So PM and count of more than 250 per microliter is widely accepted number or a single digit cutoff to form a possible diagnosis of SBP before beginning empiric antibiotic therapy. And also to note that renal failure is the major cause of death in the SBP, although the infection related mortality is very low with appropriate therapy. So one needs to take care of the kidneys and take opinion from the nephrologist from time to time if such is available to prevent this. Thank you very much.